For the third year and counting, Richard Skipper has been celebrating the artists you love. Richard Skipper is all about celebrating life, art, and his guest body of work. Please join us while he showcases these diverse and talented individuals. Here's Richard Skipper. Happy Monday, everyone, and welcome to the latest edition of Richard Skipper Celebrates. Who or what are you celebrating today? As you know, those of you who watch the show on a regular basis, I'm all about celebrating. I'm about celebrating life, art, whatever it is that you want to celebrate if you take the time to do so. I want to celebrate a very special woman in my life, and that's Judy Chorsky. And a few weeks ago, she sent me this incredible book called The Star Dressing Room. And as I was getting to know about Alan Shane and also Norman Sunshine through the book, she also sent me a double life. I said, I have to interview these two men. And lo and behold, they are here today. I am so thrilled that both of you said yes to sitting down and talking with me. And I always began my shows by asking, who or what are you celebrating today? Well, we're celebrating the uh, 65 years, 65 <laughs> years. We celebrated July 4th. That was our anniversary. You know, well, congratulations. Uh, yeah, I, I, we're going to talk about how you met, and then I've got a lot of questions uh, surrounding that time, because it took you both a little uh, time to actually get together. Uh, which one of you wants to take the gauntlet and run with that? I'll start with my version. Okay. I mean, it's not exactly Rashomon, but it's it's both points of view that are kind of interesting. I was a, an illustrator, very ambitious, living in the village, drawing all day and so forth. And I got a call from one of my friends on a Wednesday. He said his wife was sick and he had tickets for a matinee of... Uh, of a show called um, Jamaica, Jamaica. Jamaica. Oh, starring Tina Horn and Ricardo Madovan. So, of course, I said yes. The music was by Harold Harold. Harlan. Harlan. So, you know, it was very exciting. Wednesday, matinee. So, uh, we were seated in the middle of the upstairs bell, and a, 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 an announcer's voice came on and said, Today's performance will not be played by Ricardo Madovan. It'll be played by Alan Shane, and everyone went zoo, boo, boo. <laughs> they were huge, you know, very disappointed. And so we sat, we watched, and Alan came on. He was very buff, very cute, and was terrific. He was just delightful, playing an opposite Lena Horn. Imagine a star of that caliber, and Alan, the understudy, playing opposite Lena Horn. So this buddy of mine said, you know, I know this guy. He's, you know, we're off an audition together. Whatever. Let's go congratulate him. So we went backstage and there was Alan getting ready for the evening performance. And he was stripped down. He was just wearing a jock strap. And his mother was in the corner and they were putting on all this black makeup to make him look, you know, black and swarthy opposite Lena. And um, so he started talking to me, and I thought in a rather superior way, peremptory way, I didn't really dig him. So I couldn't wait to get out of there, and I said goodbye, you know, you, I really enjoyed your performance. And on the way, on the subway, that's in the book, I thought, hmm, he's sort of odd, sort of interesting. That was it. Okay, Alan, go ahead with your version. Well, it was to go on, and play opposite Lena Horne as a young actor who'd never danced, who'd never sung on Broadway, was uh, quite an ordeal. And I had to really jack myself up when I, they would make the announcement because I began the show. The show began with me coming out in a very skimpy clothes, a native clothes, with my fish over my shoulder singing to Savannah, which, who was a Lena Horn. And anyway, I was ready to go into my place when suddenly the audience would go, boo! And many people would run for the island to, aisle to get their tickets back. 
but quickly the orchestra would play and, you know, people kind of stayed. And then I had to sail down in my little boat and sing this number, which I'd never done before, really, although I'd done it at rehearsal. And I found that I had to make myself feel that I was a big star in order to do that. I really had to say, screw everybody. If they don't like it, let them go. And I'm going to do the best I can. I love what you wrote in the book because I underlined it. Because I thought, <laughs> I thought it was such a great thing that you said. But I want to go back for just a moment because you, you know, obviously were in the business. You wanted to be the understudy or standby for Ricardo Montalban. And at first, they weren't going for you in that role. Um, you didn't, as you just said, did not have the rehearsal or the time with this. And you happened to be, according to your book, uh, with your therapist uh, when you got the phone call uh, that you were going to be going on. And you had to leave and get to the theater. And, you know, and I, uh, you thought that you were going to get the opportunity to possibly run a few lines with Lena Horn. That ended up not being the case. So I can un imagine the terror that you were feeling at that moment when you had to go on. Uh, it was something you desired. It was something you dreamed about. But, but really, now the truth was that no one ever believed that I would go on. I mean, didn't. People didn't think Ricardo, who was a great, you know, uh, symbol of manhood, would ever be sick. But he was sick quite a lot. And suddenly I had to go on. And the analyst, you know, the analyst handed me the phone and said, it's for you. And they said, you're on at the matinee. And I started to shake. And I must say, the analyst was wonderful about it because he said, you always wanted to do this, and now you've got the opportunity. So enjoy it. And I must well, then to pull myself together, go home, get ready for the show, and then go to the uh, theater, hoping to see Lena, where we could go over some scenes. Lena was late. We never went over any scenes. And somehow it all worked. But what happened? was that after that performance, when I was very, um, I thought I was a great star, which was a fake. I didn't think I was a great star, but I had to believe that in order to get the audience within, in my corner. Mm -hmm. I went up to my dressing room and there was the most beautiful man I'd ever seen. And I really was shaken by that. And I was kind of behaving badly because I was still in my, star dressing room uh that's that's what i was pretending and i was being very kind of grand as i stood on this dock on a dock uh, and they tried to make me up and i think that was one of the things that made it difficult with norman first place i thought he was from california that he wasn't from new york i'd never see him again and i'd never seen anybody like that in my life and of course, from there, you know the answers. To Absolutely. And you also thought after that, you, that thought got your, through your head, you thought perhaps he was in a relationship with the friend that he came with. Uh, yeah. But then you kept running into each other uh, throughout the city. You kept bumping into each other. We did. And it was like a, it was prearranged somehow. We did bump into each other in subways and on the street. And each time Norman vaguely knew me, he would kind of look as if he had met me somewhere before. And I'd be going up the subway with my big portfolio, he'd be coming down. <laughs> so it was inevitable and yet it was comical because New York, in a funny way, when things are going to happen faithfully, it's a small city. It was that way. And so then true, if you don't want to see somebody, you can go many years and never see them. So New York. I do but, want to point out to everybody because even though your names are Alan Chain and Norman Sunshine, you're actually flipped because this is Norman that is sitting on the left, everyone, and this is Alan on the right, so that everyone watching knows this uh, if they're not familiar with you already. Um, so you're absolutely right, uh, but I want to ask you, Norman, you know, having this first impression uh, of Alan and then 
meeting him each time, Alan, you would take it on this persona that you had to carry yourself like a star uh, in order to be able to go on and convince the audience that they were going to have, as you said in your book, the best show of their lives each time you went on. Uh, as you were carrying on this persona, how long did it take uh, you, Norman, before that wall started to break down and you were starting to see the true man behind that facade? Well, I think I write about it in the book, but we met in some, uh, there was a place in the gym downstairs, a, a kind of coffee shop. And I was sitting there mulling over the fact that my father had been there just before and he was saying, you have to come back to Los Angeles where you have a business and so forth. And I never wanted to leave New York. I loved New York at that time. And I loved pushing and wangling or whatever I could do to get work. And Alan then came down and sat next to me for some reason. And he said, what's going on with you? And I blab, blab, blabbed about my father and me. And I said, the worst thing is, I just got an assignment to do some shirts for, for whatever shirt company, I can't remember, Ben Husen or one of those names. And I need a male model and my model is sick. And he, Alan said, well, I'll pose for you. So we went down to my apartment in the village and I simply could not draw Alan. I just drawing after drawing after drawing and I, I became very indifferent. I just tear up the drawings. I'd say, thank you very much. Goodbye. How much do you charge? He said, I didn't charge you anything. I did it as a favor. And so I saw a glimmer through my selfishness of his kindness and his goodness. And so I make it up to him by that terrible evening called, I think it's called the Supper. It was something yeah. about I try to cook supper. A multicolored dinner. A multicolored dinner. Multicolored dinner. Yes. In which I saw something about artist, art food, and I don't know different colors food and something. I made this terrible dinner, and we both ended up laughing about it. And that was the beginning of our friendship. And the friendship really was one of enormous interest and trust in each other. And finally, it turned, of course, into love. And, and sex and so forth. But it was a slow process of, I didn't really want a relationship at that time. All I wanted was to be a success. And I don't th I'm not sure Alan did either. Well, maybe you did more than I, but it, it, I, I well, just- well, One thing that's important, Richard, is that I was only a big star just before the curtain and just after the curtain. In other words, I didn't, I didn't act like a star or anything. I was never like that. I never showed off or did any of that stuff. Isn't that true? Absolutely true. So that I wasn't coming on as this kind of grand person, just as an ordinary nice fellow. Uh, so Norman was really seeing me as I was, not as this guy made up and dancing and singing anyway. And well, one of the things that, you know, I, first of all, congratulations on this, your latest book, The Star Dressing Room, which is a brilliant book. Uh, you're both great writers, by the way. So, uh, you know, that's another hat that you both wear. But as I'm reading The Star Dressing Room and I, you see this incredible life that you've had in film and television and then the life that the two of you have created together, getting to back to The Star Dressing Room, that here you have the star dressing room, and somehow it felt to me, and correct me if I'm wrong on any of this, but that was also elusive to you as well. That that was something that absolutely that you owned, but it was something that was in your grasp, but you didn't absolutely have it. Am I right or wrong, you know, with going with that idea of the star dressing room? The whole point of the star dressing room was that it wasn't mine. And although I was, I, you know, I played for Ricardo, I sang the songs, I did the dances, I really wasn't a star. Ricardo was. Mm -hmm. And there was something about the image of the star dressing room that you would think gave you that, that uh, position. It didn't give it to me. 
I was okay and people liked me and many people said they liked me a lot, but I didn't have that wonderful something that makes a star. And I think that's, that's part of the book and why I realized at the end of the book that that wasn't going to be my life that there was something other than just acting. Am I clear about that or have I answered your question? No, you are very clear about that. I absolutely get that. I wanna start with you, Norman. Um, if you can, and you cover this in the book, of course, both of you, uh, but just to give everyone like a Reader's Digest version in your own words, if you can give everyone the trajectory of your life uh, as a gay man or just as a man in general, leading up to the time that you began your relationship uh, with Alan? Well, you know, we were not gay activists. We didn't really think about ourselves as being symbolic in any way. We became okay. years later, mm -hmm. oddly enough. But um, we just enjoyed each other's company so much that it seemed a natural thing for us to finally move in together. We never announced anything. We never came out to our parents. We just were. And that's kind of how it all began. I, uh, as I say, in my case, I was very ambitious to be an illustrator. And I was to some degree. And then this woman from the New York Times called me and said, can you draw fashion? I said, oh, sure, you know, lying. And I lied about anything to get a job was the fashion editor of the New York Times. And so she took me to shows in a limousine uh, during fashion season, and I would sketch whatever she'd point to. And then the next day it would appear under her byline, Pat Peterson sees blah, blah, blah. And it would be a sketch by Norman Sunshine. So I got a call from, that's the small town part of it. I got a call from almost every art director in every <laughs> uh, store from uh, Lord and Taylor to Peck and Peck, to, they all wanted me to draw for them. Finally, I was put under contract to Saks Fifth Avenue. I never had intended to be a fashion illustrator, never, but I could draw. And um, so that was that. And then I met this crazy woman. That's another part of it. Probably mm -hmm. through Alan's ex-wife, that Jeff, whatever. This woman and I, enjoyed each other so much and we would sort of go to this vodor and bump into each other and drink and laugh and one day she said to me why don't you go into advertising i said i'm a successful illustrator why should i go into advertising she said because it's it's a dying field it's all being replaced by photography and i think you'd be good at it i just think you're too bright to be just drawing for the model all day long I said, okay, I'll try it. So I went to work for her. The first day, she, the art director, she was standing in the hallway and they had this little bottle of perfume and it was something by Carbon. This is not in the book, I don't think. And um, she said, what would you say about this, you know, this perfume? I said, I don't know, I visualize a girl nude, kissing her own shoulder and saying, go ahead, be a narcissist. That's my headline. And at the bottom, there would just be this bottle of Carvan perfume. They both looked at each other and ran <laughs> into their various directions. And it indeed became a full page in the New Yorker and Vogue and Harper's Bazaar and won all kinds of awards. And that was the beginning. And then, of course, the next famous thing I did was, you know, I was now very good at headlines. I was very clever at concept and, um, and, and design, but that, that was all part of the, it was a very small agency, so you could probably do anything. So then there's the, the sequence in which Jane Trahey was sitting in her yellow office and she said, I've got these mink farmers and I've given them a name, you know, uh, it's it's a black mink and they're, you know, GLMA, uh, black mink, uh, Great Lakes Mink Association, black llama. What do you think of that? I said, it's terrific change. She said, close the door. <laughs> I love this. I can't figure out a headline. So I shut the door. I was uh, sweating from my last meeting, which was um, Danskin's company. Danskin's are not just for dancing. Another one of my inspirations. And uh, I was caressing this black mink on this big sofa. 
and she hands me her headlines and I said, these don't make it. And I thought, mm, you know, these are, this would be very becoming on a woman. What do you think of this? And I handed her in a yellow sheet, dance, I mean, sorry, um, what becomes a legend most? She ran <laughs> with the line and she said, and that became the campaign. And it's still, it is. 25 years later, they still write about this line. They use it. I have two posters on my wall, and they're both from that campaign. Just no. beautiful. I mean, yeah, well, congrats. I mean, that was amazing. I mean, were you, were you surprised at the uh, longevity of that campaign? So many, I mean, every famous actress in the world, and some men as well, wanted no. to be part of that campaign. Richard? Yes. I want to go back to something you said earlier, because we were talking about not really being activists and not, you know, just being what we were, working I as an actor, Norman as an artist. But something happened through our friend Joan Rivers. She was a friend of ours in Connecticut, and we were very fond of her. And she gave a party, usually for Christmas. Yes. He insisted on going around, I don't know, I think this is in the book, uh, going around the table and everybody had to say what they were grateful for this Christmas. And everybody groaned and said, oh, for God's sake, Joan, you have to ruin the evening. She said, I want it. I want it. I want it my way. So we went around the room and Joan said she was so happy that her kids and her uh, grandson were so happy and so wonderful and not on drugs and that every her, her life was wonderful. And a friend of hers who was an English kind of countess talked about how wonderful the, uh, the wheat had done this year, or something ridiculous. For harvest. And then a, a little guy, young guy said he was very happy for the dog he got at Christmas. And I suddenly, and this was really quite early, we had never talked about being gay. We just never talked about it. We we lived it, but then we didn't deny it, but it wasn't part of our thing. And I suddenly said, I'm happy because Norman and I have been together 50 years. And everybody was amazed that we've been together so long. And then everybody congratulated us. And as we left the room, the young man who had the dog came up and said, you really are a symbol to us of what it can be. Mm -hmm. I have a young relationship and I would love it to be like yours. And we got in the car and we started to drive. And I thought, you know, we have a responsibility in a way to say to people, look, this is possible. I mean, people can live together, love together, even be faithful to each other. And uh, that's possible. And we talked in the car and I said to Norman, I think we should write something. And Norman said, yeah, I think maybe you should. And I began to write a book about us. And I would interview Norman about things that I'd forgotten or things about his childhood. And one day he came to me and said, I hate this stuff that you're writing. I think it's just awful. It's not, <laughs> not true. I want to write it myself. So I said, fine, why not? So we began then to write alternate chapters of our life, which is what is, of course, um, double life. Yeah, double life. And from that, working together, we, we worked separately, but then we would put our, our ideas together, mm -hmm. came the book. And uh, it was a wonderful, wonderful experience for us, I think. Yeah, and you know, at the time, um, publishers rejected it with the most beautiful rejection letters you'd ever hoped for. Talk about star dressing room. Yeah. These were star rejection letters. And uh, reason being, for the most part, our business people say there's no market for this. Yes. There's no bookshelf for this. They say gays don't buy books. So, <laughs> I love that. 
You so love we, that? Gays don't buy books. So we found this very small publisher. He was just beginning, and he published it. I, I must say, did a beautiful job. And um, the book, after how many years? Twelve, about twelve years. It's still selling. It's yeah. still selling. Now own the rights. So we, you know, we have to drive to the post office and send the books out. Well, there. The thing I want to point out is that the book is still selling, but the publishing house that published the book is no longer around. Pardon? Uh, the original publishing house that published the book is no longer around. Am I correct? No, oh, they're not. They went out of business. So we kind of do it ourselves, and and we were stunned. That suddenly there'd be an order for five books. How do they hear about it? How do they know it? It still goes on. So more they, and more, and we, and we we got letters from all over the world during its high period, from not only men but women saying this is about a relationship. All the trials and tribulations that we went through, my husband and I, blah blah blah, have all you know. It's very universal. Your 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 whatever you're saying. So, also we've had terrifically adventurous lives. We've met some great people. There is a postscript to this. Joan Rivers always said to us, "Write it down." When we would go and visit her, or when she we would go on her yacht which we did a couple of times. She, we tell anecdotes because everybody told anecdotes in those days. Mm -hmm. She would always say, write it down, write it down. And we did in, the, in this book. And Joan would gave us the uh, opening party in New York, which was amazing. It was at 21. It was a launch party in which everyone wrote about Joan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, uh, but no, no one wrote about us, but they wrote Joan was terrific. But uh, she said that in a note, it was very cute. She said, we handed her the manuscript, which was about this big, you know, it was just typewritten page. And we said, here, Joan, here's our, our book. And she said, you know, I schlepped that around in a paper bag to every one of the gigs that I had. And when I finished it, I didn't want it to end. I mm. just of that book. She said it brought tears to my eyes. So we were very rewarded by her, her take on it, you know. I read somewhere recently where the, the writer said that basically what all of us, whether we write books or not, we all present the director's cut to the world. In other words, we present to the world that story that we want to share about ourselves. As each of you were writing not only this book, but the other books that you've written, how do you s decide what you feel is important to tell and what you feel is secret to both of you that you have not shared with the world? I've mean, shared everything. Pretty much so, but, but I must say in terms of the polish that a book gets, so that the editor is very much involved. In that. There's mm -hmm. writing and then there's editing and the editing you can do two or three versions of, of a book until the editor said, it, okay, let's go to press with this. But Richard, we, we published things that we hadn't even told each other, and we felt that we had to be honest about it. Isn't that true? That sequence, I mean, the yeah. sequence where I'm arrested, you know, and in the park, in Griffith Park, very painful for me to write about it. Alan didn't know anything about that, and then the... the uh, publisher, the, the, the editor didn't want, want that in the book. And I said, it must, must be in the book because this can't be all goodness and sweetness. It has to show that gays, you know, can be persecuted and being gay is not you know, a walk in the par park, if you'll pardon me. Yes, yes, yeah. So, um, so the editor has, as I said, has a lot to do with it in choosing the material and you can fight, you know, to keep material in or fight out. But anyway, they're, they're a helpful, they're an adversary and they're, they're a helpmate. Well, before either of you started writing these books, uh, did you keep journals uh, prior to this? Because, I mean, uh, I, I, I know your process of you each deciding to write your version of the story. Did you have any arguments over uh, how certain things transpired? No, because when we finally decided that we would both do the book and do alternate chapters, I never interfered with Norman's chapter, nor did he interfered with mine. I think we were helpful to each other. Alan had kept journals most of his life. Mm -hmm. I hadn't. And so 
there I would be my computer in my little loft trying to force out memories of this certain place in the book that we decided I should write about. And that was very interesting for me because there's a tremendous amount of, of um, information within your brain mm -hmm. that most people don't tap into. And then I decided I'm a writer, I could write this and added my whatever personality to it. That was very revealing to me, very in, in, inspiring and, and hopefully interesting. I found in, in a star dressing room, I had a lot of journals that I had done from that age, the age of 17, 18, 20, and uh, long before I was what I was now. But it all came back. So many of those journals set off things in my head that I began to remember. Colors and rooms and furniture and people. It was just, it all begins to happen. And, and also when you write, you don't really know what you're going to write. You go and start to write and, and all sorts of things come back. And I think that's what happened. Uh, I've now writ written five books, one with Norman and... Uh, Actually two with me. The one I illustrated. The yes, but you didn't write that no, book. No, no. We did a children's book to begin with. You also, you also have this, which is an incredible your art is phenomenal. Boom, that's me. Yes, yes. <laughs> so, um, and that was interesting because the I made the presentation to this wonderful book designer who I think did a terrific job on that book, just beautiful. And uh, I said, I, so it was about this big at one time. She said, no one's going to sit in bed and read that book that you have in mind. They just, it's too heavy. Trust me, it should be readable, and you should make those chapters kind of lead up to something. So it really is a kind of my memoir, again, through through art, through visual art. Mm -hmm. That was fun to do and interesting for me. Alan, going back and starting to write, and the fact that you had kept journals and everything, what was the one thing that you learned about yourself from, let's uh, go specifically with the star dressing room, uh, going back and telling these stories, and you've had this amazing career where you have really been in many aspects of the business. What one thing surprised you the most about yourself looking back over everything? I guess all the years that I spent uh, kind of trying to conform remember that I went to New York when I was 17. I was that, 18. That was a time when if you were known to be gay, uh, you, were not, you wouldn't get any work. Agents wouldn't send you out and you would only be kind of uh, thought of for a gay role. And there were no gay roles uh, except, except for Edward Everett Horton in those days. So really you had to be very careful no one ever talked about being gay except within their, their close friends. And I think so much of my early life, which is in the book, is about trying to conform being with uh, women, certainly, although I liked women, but I, it was clear to me that, that they were not my special thing. And uh, so that those early years of trying one, I, I had a marriage of convenience. I then was with an actress for five years as we kept delaying our marriage date and never did it. So I think probably when I thought about it, a lot of time was wasted, but it was a difficult time. I mean, people just couldn't uh, deal with it very well. And I think finally, in the book, as you know, uh, I, meet, I meet Norman and finally we are together. And that makes the whole 65 years worthwhile. Absolutely. Well, obviously your friends, the people that were part of your life, you both said, and, and I also uh, know that Alan, you never had a conversation with your parents that said, I'm gay and you never had that 
coming out process. Um, I've never, you know, because I didn't really have that either. It was just a, a natural part of who I am. Uh, but with both of you, was there a specific moment that you can say, this is my coming out process? Uh, or it, do you feel that the book was that statement that you were both making? I think I finally, with analysis, was able to deal with it and to, to not hide it any longer. Although, you know, everybody, by that point, people knew that I was gay. When we went to Hollywood, for example, and I had a very important role in, in Warner's television, Everybody knew that we were gay. We lived together. We gave parties together. We entertained the network people together. It just wasn't talked about. It just wasn't. We do have that one issue where I write about that for the New York Times. I did an op-ed piece, which was when I won the Emmy Award. Mm -hmm. You remember that? And Alan, we were advised not to go as a couple suddenly, well, what are you talking about? You know, we're not advised to go as a couple because that would be, that's just not good for the position that Alan's in, basically. So we went to this, I went to this award thing and got trunk on terrific California Chardonnay and um, wobbled to the stage when they announced my name. And I kept giving Alan and the director credit for whatever the concept of these things. And then I was so furious that Alan wasn't there that when I finally met Alan in Palm Springs or something, I kind of lashed out to him and I said, look, I won this and so forth. And he said, I'll never let this happen again. And he was crying. And that was the beginning of our really standing up for ourselves and this relationship we were so proud of and so happy with, right? Yes, and you know, part of that was when they made me president of Warner Brothers Television, mm -hmm. they were very worried about the fact that I was gay and that I wouldn't be able to sell shows easily to the uh, old boy. It turned out not to be true at all, and I sold a lot of shows, but, but they were worried about it. And it wasn't that they were homophobic, they were just looking for their money and they felt that it wouldn't work. And then finally they decided to make me president. But it was, it was, it was a difficult time. It's still difficult. Now it's all it's even difficult, But I want to mention something. I mean, both of you have been very, very fortunate. You've lived here in New York. You've also lived on the West Coast. I'm from a small town in South Carolina. And I say to people all the time, there's an entire country out there between New York and California where it is still difficult for people to live their authentic lives. And especially in today's political climate, I think that we're retreating. I mean, are you both picking up on that energy as well and seeing how, I mean, your book, first of all, thank you for writing this book. I also thank Joan Rivers, uh, <laughs> or, you know, insisting that, or that everyone say what you're grateful for. And at that moment, when you came out and said that you were grateful for the years that you had together, uh, had you voiced that publicly prior to that? Not really, but I'll tell you right now, we live in Florida. We see exactly and we read exactly what's going on here. This kind of fascistic mentality of people burning books and people, you know, and Housewives, you know, taking books out of libraries that they think their children shouldn't read. And terrifying. It's terrifying. We're so terrified. We're very much thinking about moving. And then we're thinking about moving to Spain. And we read the paper today that Spain is going to have a, a right-wing government. It's, it's, the whole world is just retreating in some peculiar way. I did a, a piece for the Miami Herald <coughs> about book burning that they printed a few weeks ago. Oh, brilliant piece. I, I read it. Incredible. Oh, yeah. I'm yes. glad. Because it really says, you know, burn the books and then burn the people. It's just one step away. That's what Hitler did. 
Well, and obviously, you know, and this is a sad thing for me to even verbalize, uh, but your incredible book would not even be allowed in some libraries in the state uh, of Florida right now. Uh, the uh, the Star Dressing Room is really touted in any way. I don't think it's even put in bookstores now. And that's my new book out for what a month, but nothing is happening. I don't think people want gay books now, or they're afraid. It's uh, and and my book really is about everything. It's about men and women and relationships. I know and, that you both said that you did not start out to be activist, but living in the world and the climate that we live, and you felt that it was important for your voices to be heard. Uh, when did you, number one, A, begin to feel a shift in the way that the world accepted the gay community? Because there, uh, I felt that there was a time where it was actually being accepted. And then when did you begin to feel that we started to retreat in the opposite direction? Yeah, I, I think we thought things were getting much better. Uh, in the last few years, and then suddenly, with our presence, it's politics. Governor, they, of they use gays are now like they were in, in Germany. We just saw about uh, Nazi Germany and how it evolved, and how they use the gays as a scapegoat. And then finally, the gays could. I mean, in, in Berlin at that time, this is about Berlin. I don't know if you saw it with. This it's on Netflix. Very good. Very it's good. Excellent. With incredible uh, sort of palace of pleasure and the gays all. Suddenly the gays are being dragged off the street, put in jail and, and incarcerated or killed. And by the way, that suddenly it happened so fast. It didn't end with the war. They went on hurting them and treating them very badly for a long time. I lost them. I, I can you hear me, Alan and Norman? Uh, I somehow you've disappeared. Uh, I hope they they come back. Uh, the best thing to do is let me. I'm sorry. That's our you are. You are. <laughs> I lost you for a moment. I thought that somebody took you out. So uh, someone's listening to us. So you were saying, uh, Alan. No, just that, that um, we have felt it's all going back in the last year or so, especially with DeSantis and, and all of his politicizing. And we're, we're very conscious of it. The book burning is the, was the first, we were terrified of that. Imagine burning people's books and keeping them away from children. I mean, it's just all so insane. When the two of you were writing um, A Double Life, uh, did you share with your friends and colleagues that you were writing this book? No. And if so, what kind of research? Oh, you said no at all. We didn't. We, no. just, we just wrote for ourselves. No, and we didn't show it to people. Joan saw it early mm -hmm. because she was so responsible for it, but very few people saw it. So once the book came out originally, what kind of response did the two of you start getting on the book? Oh, one thing I must say is that we were very helped by Larry um, Kramer. Kramer. Larry Kramer said to a, a, a writer kind of producer, this is a book that should be published and you must do it. It's very important. And that really did that, isn't it? So Larry was very important about that. And David Webster, his partner. They felt that the book should be should be published. Um, when it came out, in the first place, we were amazed that we had a book out. And there were, were our pictures on the front. It looked, it looked so beautiful, didn't it, the book? He called us for some at 21 going over the wine list that Jones wanted us to do for this launch. It's so dark there during the day, in the old days, it was so pitch dark. And, and the publisher, editor, publisher called, he said, I'm so excited that the book has just come out, the cover's terrific. We said, we'd love to see it. He said, I'll be right over. 
So we came over in a taxi and it was so dark we couldn't see the cover. <laughs> so oh. we ran to the men's room and held it under a light and we were just thrilled that we both looked so gorgeous. And but the book was so beautifully laid out and I thought, I thought it was a beautiful production, you know. So um, that, that's <laughs> the publishing end of it. Well, once it came out, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. You go ahead, Richard. No, I was going to say, when the book came out, what kind of response did you start getting from your friends? And I mean, because you both are very honest and uh, upfront and open about uh, almost every aspect of your life. What kind of response did you start getting from the people that were close to you? I think it was very good. Yeah. I, I, it was excellent. Nobody criticized. How, how dare they criticize it? I mean, what <laughs> of course, of course. A terrible book? No. No, everybody was very, first of all, to have a friend publish a book is very exciting for the whole community of, of friends. Well, so, and also there were anecdotes and stories and, you know, so that people kind of could enjoy it. And then there were things that were not so enjoyable. Um, the fact that we had a period of, of uh, almost breaking up and separation. So forth. Yeah. And that was due to my ambition, you know. Mm -hmm. I just felt I was getting nowhere at that time. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you know, we get went back to appreciating our relationship even more. So. But I so I want to talk. Uh, you know, I'll sh share something. My uh, my husband and I, uh, we've been together thirty four years. Uh, we uh, were together twenty one years when it became legal to get married in New York. Uh, I asked him to get married the day that it became legal, and uh, I I jokingly say uh, it would have been terrible if after twenty one years he had said no, I don't want to marry you. <laughs> uh, so. You were together how many years when you were allowed to get married? It was done in 24. Um, so we would have been, let's see, two, 42. Yeah, like about over 50 years. You know, it's legal first in Massachusetts, remember? And so. A couple of friends of ours in Connecticut had already done it. We saw these pictures and they said, it's not so tough. You just go to in Nantucket and there's a, a woman there that's a judge and she'll, she'll sign you in and, and she'll you know, do the ceremony. So we did just that and we, we stayed at the, uh, what was that, that hotel across the water? Uh, I don't remember. Anyway. We're there. Oh, we met met her. She had, she's since died, but she had long red hair, and she. We hired a photographer just to prove that this had happened, and mm -hmm. he brought his daughter and this judge. His teenage daughter. We were very embarrassed to have her just be the only witness. She was fourteen or something. But anyway, there we were, and we went across. It was it was a gray gray day. That picture that you have with uh, under the umbrellas, which is so yes. charming. It was a gray day, and then when she started the ceremony, the sun came out for some reason, and we had these shadows, and it was just very beautiful, very emotional. And then Alan started to cry, <laughs> and he really cried. He ran down to the ocean, and I had to pull him back and comfort him and say, "It's it's fine, it's okay," you know. So it just was such. A, it's like windows were open. Mm -hmm. at a, you never, we had never thought there was any emotion involved. The reason we did the uh, wedding was to say, look, we were out and we can do that. Do it to show other people that they can do it. And that's why we did it. We didn't have any feeling about it. It was a dreary day. And then suddenly when you look at somebody in the eyes and realize that you're giving them your life, it's terribly emotional, and uh, I couldn't recover. I think I didn't recover really. You still haven't recovered. I haven't. <laughs> I'm still still overwhelmed by it. It, it. it is an overwhelming experience when you have that moment, and for those 
who don't understand the importance of this is something that we have fought for for years and years and years, even if you're not an activist. And, uh, you know, at one point, I never considered myself an activist. Uh, I think in today's world, it's important for everyone to be an activist, whether it's a gay cause or anything. Absolutely. Because what's going on now is so destructive and so frightening. Uh, I'm always interested to know when a book is uh, ready for the reader. Was this a decision that you two made? Was it made by your editor or was it made by the publisher? I think the Double Life was made by the publisher or editor. He kept asking for changes and changes and changes and it really went on a long time. Uh, and I, I think he was right. Mm -hmm. Then the two other books that I wrote, um, Finding Sylvia and also The Rain May Pass, I didn't really have that kind of editor and I didn't have the same problem. By then I was also easier to write. I knew more about writing. And then finally in, in um, the star dressing room, I didn't have any help. I was, always, I was always advised by a brilliant woman named Kate Medina, who works at, uh, Random, works as one of the heads of Random House. And she was very, always a great fan of the books and would help me in a sense of taking a look at it and saying, I think maybe this is too long or something. So we did have help on, we had help with an editor on the first book. A um, wonderful woman named, can you remember? Oh, oh, oh yeah, no, I can't. Um, it's a funny Polish name. Anyway, so we did have help on the first one more than I think on the others. And you had help with your artist uh, publisher. Well, she was, yes. She was helpful. Helpful. very much as. And also the. Uh, the art uh, director. There, yeah. Were you getting suggestions from both the editors and the publisher? And, uh, you know, they they want the book to succeed, obviously. Uh, were there changes that were difficult for you to make in the book? Or do you feel that the book that we have in our hands now is absolutely the book that you wanted people to have in their hands? Norman, for years, has said that part of the book that wasn't there, he felt should have been there. I find that it really... It's not true, but but uh, that's it. That's your opinion, isn't it? Still, what a double life? Yeah. Well, I think it was really pretty accurate. There was a lot of cutting. There was a whole set of my best writing that was cut, and I've never forgiven him for it. Never. Um, but that's. I think the structure is concise enough so that the reader can be entertained and move and get it and so forth. So um, I, I, I'm okay about it now. I mean, it was never a huge issue. I was sort of disappointed in the cuts that were so severe, mainly about my write, my gorgeous writing, the descriptive passages and so forth. Well, I was gonna say that, you know, when you start to sit down and write, and you mentioned this earlier, uh, Alan, you picked up on this, uh, that, you begin to remember, uh, remember colors and uh, textures and smells and everything starts coming into you. And, and I'm, uh, I think that I can speak for both of you, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, that as you're sitting down to write, you want the reader to have as much of that experience that you both experienced as possible. Otherwise, don't why you don't want to bore them. I think there comes a point when you're giving maybe too much material that is not necessary. And there, we were telling stories and um, I think that was what we were doing with our books. And still, they're not, I mean, it's not Chekhov, it's not Bernard Shaw, it's telling a story. And we're, we're, I think we're fairly good at that. You're and great. You're it. amazing at it. I love, I, I couldn't put the books down. I mean, and Judy Chorsky, I love her so much. Uh, when she sent these books to me, uh, it was the greatest gift. 
uh, because they are incredible stories. We're going to run out of time in a few moments. This hour has flown for me. Uh, but I want to start with you, Norman, and I want to ask you, what is your favorite part about Alan that we read in the book? Uh I think my favorite part about Alan is his, his humanity, his goodness, his kindness, his love for me. He's given me a great life, great, great life. I couldn't have had it with anyone else. And uh, I hope I've given him the same in return. I'm, I'm much more spoiled and selfish. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm just a different personality than Alan. And yet somehow or other, it's just worked so beautifully and it's you know 65 years absolutely <laughs> as joan would say my husband would tell you it feels like 65 years <laughs> so uh and uh alan i want to ask you the same question about norman uh your favorite passage in the book or something that is your favorite part in the book well i think i can answer it better it was very important to me as a young person to believe in love and to believe that it was something lasting and not just, you know, just a roll in the hay. And I found with Norman that I could be with one person all my life and be totally satisfied. I mean, God knows there are moments when we're not totally satisfied, but <laughs> you went far between, and they're nothing. I mean, they're really nothing. But that was very important to me. As far as the book and Norman, I always admired that he was an artist, and that was very important to me, that, that I respected him as an artist and his vision of life that was not mine but it made it interesting and it made it more alive for me than if I'd been with someone else. So that was important, but it, it was everything. It was just saying, this is it. And that's, I kept that going for, well, I don't know, 64 years, maybe not the fifth so much. <laughs> Great. So I've got one last question for both of you. And uh, Norman, uh, one thing that you learned about Alan that you really didn't know about him until you read his passages of the book. Um, I guess I really didn't face the struggles he had with his heterosexual side. That was, I knew that it existed and I actually met Jacqueline who, you know, turned to be probably a man and, um, but the other one, the actress who was so delightful, very important soap opera actress. And Alan sexually was, you know, it just, there was a whole side of him in terms of what he had to try and what he had to give up in order to finally face his own self and get me, I guess. That was interesting for me. And then Alan is, so uh, encouraging to me as an artist that without his support, I don't know if I'd be as, but then when you see my book and you see how, you know, the energy that I had as an artist and the various phases that created me as an artist, it's, that, that's exciting. And Alan encouraged me to do that book very much so. Okay. And Alan, same question for you, something that, about Norman, that you discovered after reading his passages of the book? I discovered that he was unfaithful. <laughs> I knew, didn't know that until I read the passage in the book. Now, I, I, I read it before it was published, but and it was important that it was there. This Norman was, I mean, in the first place, I guessed something was going on. That wasn't too nice. And then I was, I was able to get through it, which is very important. I was able to get through it because I knew that it wasn't really the Norman that I loved and that, that I knew would make me happy. 
and that he was going through a period that was not so happy for him. And I, 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 I was, I wasn't really seeing it for what it was. And I was able to, to uh, I think, work with that and came out the right side. Um, it's, it's very important that, that people go through different periods and sometimes they go through a period when they need some kind of uh, en encouragement. Mm -hmm. I couldn't give him at that moment. At that moment, I couldn't give it to him. And I was then able to more to was to do it later, but not at that moment. Is that making any sense or not? You're, you're making perfect sense. I want to thank you both uh, for not only the what you've given to the world in terms of uh, your books, in terms of your art, in terms of your contributions to the theater and film and television. Uh, I thank you and I applaud you both. I'm all about celebrating people and their body of worth. And I think that our worth is what we need to focus on. And everybody, everybody, I believe, is worthy. So I want to thank you both. I'm going to have my closing remarks. And then I'm going to give both of you a chance to say your closing remarks. Uh, you can decide who will go first and who will follow that person. I'm going to leave uh, the screen to give you that chance to have your closing remark. And when you say goodbye, the final credits will roll. So don't worry about how to end this. Uh, I want to thank everybody for being here today. I hope that you will get these books. They are incredible. Uh, a Double Life. This is just two of the books. Uh, and of course, The Book of Norman is also an amazing book. I am glad to have all of these books. I want to thank you all for being here. I know that I don't take it lightly uh, when you take the time to spend an hour with me and my guest uh, and what an amazing guest we've had today. Uh, I end every show by telling everyone to go out and do something nice for somebody else without expecting anything in return. Uh, order two of these books. Keep one for yourself and then go to your Facebook friends list and reach out to the second name that pops up and send them a copy and put a little inscription in the book and tell them why they matter in your life. Better yet, pick up the phone and call them. Not an email message, not a text message, not a private inbox message, but a phone call to let someone know that they've made a difference in your life. And someone pointed out something very important to me yesterday. And it's something that I've been thinking about a long time. She said, please tell your viewers that just because you post it on Facebook doesn't mean that everybody sees it. And sometimes it's a shock when you post that someone has passed away or some uh, major transition in someone's life uh, when they have not been prepped or prepared to read it. So be careful with what you post and those phone calls are important. I have a dear friend, he says, we're all in the same storm, but we're in different size boats. And I always say, I don't care what size boat you're on, as long as you have a skipper by your side. Alan, Norman, I admire both of you so much. And it means the world to me that you said yes to me and being here today. And so thank you. And I'm going to leave the screen and it's all yours and you can decide who's going to go first. It's all yours. I'll see you all tomorrow, everyone. Goodbye. You go first. Richard, you've been, in a way I dreaded this thing and you've been so appealing and so uh, open and so giving as an interviewer that I've enjoyed every minute of it. So I just want to say at the end of this, bravo to you and your incredible skills as an interviewer and whatever this, you know, this uh, show is about. Uh, it's tremendous talent and a tremendous accomplishment. And you've made me feel very relaxed. And Alan, of course, is much more used to this than I am because, you know, he's, he was a performer. So um, I did my best. Alan? I think, Richard, the, everything Norman says is true. You are remarkable. I think that what I want to say is really about burning the books. I mean, I think more and more I go back to what is happening in our country. The idea that some gays are thinking of leaving our country is outrageous. And uh, we live in Florida, 
and we live very well, so we don't, we're not being treated badly, but it's yeah. all around us and we feel it. We know it's not good. And we, we just share with you and you brought it up. It's wonderful that something's wrong and that it has to be fixed that we were on our way in this country. I mean, the, the, the poll numbers were wonderful on the, on the way which men and women treated gay people. They were fabulous. And now look what's happening. They're dropping. People are taking books out of the library and burning them. It's very important that all of us realize that and realize, well, I hate to say it, but that love is the reason that we're here. And it's very important. And that's the thing we have to remember. I think that's all I have.